slotted for this session. So if he manages, manages to join um, us soon, we, we may take over from me, but, but let's start the session. So it's my pleasure then to introduce the first speaker of the session, that is um, Dr. Zahid Kimi from the Foundation of Human Rights. Um, now, Zahid, we are very pleased that you are joining us on the program, of course, because you and your team have played a very interesting role um, this well, the last few months, very much specifically dedicated to COVID-19 tracking and model developments for tracking of the virus. And the CHPC, of course, played an uh, important role there. So I'm very pleased to, to welcome you to the program and I'm gonna hand over straight to you to, to do your presentation. So thank you very much. Over to you. Um, I'm just going to play his um, video, so just give me a minute so if I can just get it loaded. Thank you, Corne. So thanks everybody for your patience. We will get this going shortly. Um, I suppose this is part of the, the way that it sometimes go with these virtual events and we at the CHPC are also learning as we go along. So thanks for your patience. Sorry, Vanner, I'm gonna I'm I'm having some technical issues playing that video. So please let me know if you can see and hear the video as well if I start playing it. Okay, I will do. Okay, let's try again. Can you see the video? Um, I can only see your, your files. There's no video that is starting to play yet. Okay, sorry. Um, it's not working at this stage. Uh, shall I just give my talk live then? Um, Zahir, I would appreciate if you could, please. Okay, you give me one minute. Thank you, Zahid. I hope you will not gonna talk without slides. <laughs> just find the right screen to share. Okay. Thanks, yeah, that, that looks good. You can, you can see it. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. I'm going to be talking about the development of a spatial model uh, for COVID-19. Um, just to give an idea, this uh, project started uh, very early on uh, as the um, epidemic started to hit. Uh, I was asked to be part of an NICD that's National Institute for Communicable Diseases and the Department of Health team uh, to develop a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there were a lot, lots of people and, and institutions uh, putting together models for COVID-19. And this particular model was a very large team. Uh, the actual nuts and bolts behind it was uh, developed by Sally Archibald, Robert Benetto, Ronald Richmond, and myself. And then a team from the CSIR provided some additional analysis. Uh, Pravesh Deba, Jenny Holloway, and Montan Beto to Danny Clone. And there were loads of other people who gave uh, bits and pieces of advice. So the first question we today have to answer is why are, would we want to put together a spatial model? 
I'm going to go through this very briefly because it, it does get a little bit uh, complicated. But the standard way of modeling uh, epidemics, pandemics, is to use something called a compartmentalized model. It's also called an SEIR model. And one of the fundamental assumptions is something called homogeneous interaction, which means that each person in the model is equally likely to interact with any other person in the model. So essentially, if you're infected, you have a probability of infecting anyone else, and you have equal probability of infecting anyone else in the model. So at a national level, this would mean that someone in uh, Bloemfontein, if they were infected, would be as likely to infect their next door neighbor as they were to infect someone in a small rural town in Limpopo, for example. So obviously that, um, that's not uh, feasible. It works on a large scale, um, but it's not entirely accurate. We know that the interaction is spatially constrained because this is a disease that's transmitted primarily through airborne and interpersonal contact. And so we know that the spread of the infection isn't uniform, but will be fundamentally determined by the movement patterns of individuals and in particular infected individuals. So one of the questions would be, what would be the effect of including a spatial component? Uh, and the reason we wanted to know this was, would it give us a more accurate model? And in particular, would it give us the ability to see what variations in local conditions would have on the spread of the infection. And local conditions can vary from the age structure of the population, socioeconomic conditions, overcrowding, climate conditions, um, the degree to which the community is isolated. So all of these things would play a role in how the disease actually spread. And the idea was that the spatial model would at least in theory be more accurate at predicting the spread of the infection over time. And also not just answer the how many question, which is what everyone asks, how many infected, recovered and dead people do we expect to see, but also where we expect to see them, which province or municipality and which city, etc. The idea here was that for planning purposes, the finer detail we had at the spatial level, the better we'd be able to plan, at least in theory. So what do we need to do to set up that spatial model? We need a spatial layer. In this case, we decided to use the 4,000 wards, approximately 4,000 wards in South Africa. There are many choices you can make. You can use province, you can use municipality, you can use a voting district or a numerator area. There are costs and benefits to all of those. Ward, we think, gave us a nice balance between granularity and uh, a reasonable computational load. You also need an SEIR model, and there are many of these uh, floating about. Uh, but at least within South Africa and to some extent internationally, uh, we've settled on uh, a fairly standard formulation of these models, and I'll talk a bit about them when we we do an example. Um, I should just mention, of course, the, the gold standard would be not to use a spatial layer at all, but to use individuals, an agent-based model. But we were certainly not up to uh, tackling that, uh, given uh, uh, the short response time we were, were being asked to respond by. So you need an SEIR model. Um, and you need a, some way of measuring how people have moved between your spatial units, in this case, wards. And we used something, uh, we used mobility matrices for estimating the movement of people between wards. And of course, you, we don't want that to be a static thing. We wanted that to be as accurate as possible. And thank you, Vodacom stepped in and made available uh, the detailed data of the, the detailed data they had on tracking people moving between wards, uh, monitoring the actual cell phone movements. So we were able to access that data and that gave us a decent estimate of what we thought population movements were. And then we need some way to put this all together. So I'm gonna give you a, a sort of a very simplified version of how it works. Uh, you have your various wards. Um, 
and you have an SEIR model that runs in each ward. And the model parameters are adjusted for local conditions. I've already mentioned, for example, the age structure of the population, um, socioeconomic conditions, uh, climate potentially, and also you could uh, use different levels of interventions in different wards. You could say this ward is under a different level of shutdown to some other ward, or you could even make assumptions about some of the fundamental parameters, the rate of transmission, the RT, uh, whether that differs between wards. You run each of these models for a time step, and at each time step you generate a new, which is what SEIR models do, they generate a new number of exposed cases people who've just recently been infected. And what we did was we exported those exposed cases to other wards based on the movement data. So if we take an extreme example, if no movement were allowed, everyone was in absolute total shutdown, then each of the wards would operate independently. So all of your infected cases would stay within that ward. The other extreme case is if you allow absolute free movement. Anyone can move from any ward randomly to another. Then your cases would be distributed uh, evenly across all wards. I should mention now, I'll come back to that, that export function wasn't uh, fixed, it was stochastic. So it, it was based on a probability function, which was derived from the mobility matrices. Of course, you have to run that for each ward. So each ward generates excess cases which have to be distributed uh, depending on the mobility data. And then each ward receives excess cases potentially again from other wards. So you have to run all of that summing up uh, and consolidating at each time step. And then you have to run it, the model for your time steps uh, uh, as required, depending on how long you want to run your model for. I've mentioned that the spatial spread is stochastic, not deterministic. We don't know exactly where people move, and we certainly don't know exactly where the infected people move. So we have to construct a probability function that says, if there are 100 cases, 90 of them stay in the ward, 10 of them go to the next door ward um, on average. But at each run, you could have, for example, 80-20 or 95-5, depending on your draw from the probability function. In addition, you have the SEIR model parameters that are themselves not fixed. So even if you were running non-spatially an SEIR model, you would have some variability built into your parameters, uh, your R0, um, uh, your various other probabilities, the length of infection, the length to which uh, the duration uh, to which people stay infected, the probability each person has of infecting some other person, etc. All of those are drawn from probability distributions. So they are uh, a, a source of uncertainty in your model. So in terms of the computing resources we required, clearly if you have to run 4,000 SEIR models at each time step, one for each ward, as I said, you have to do the allocation of cases between each of these wards at each time step. In addition, you have to run a large enough number of simulations to account for the multiple sources of variability, the spatial spread and the model parameters. Both of those sources of variability. You can't just run one model over your time step and then think that that's the answer. The idea behind modeling is in addition to having an answer you want to have some estimate of what the level of uncertainty is in the outputs you're producing. In addition, you may want to run different scenarios. So certainly you'd want to ask what will happen if we have different lockdown levels or we start the model, we initialize it at various time points. What if we have different lockdown levels that operate differentially in different provinces, etc. Now that never happened in South Africa. We did pretty much did a, a one size fits all uh, level of intervention. Uh, but we've seen in other countries that that's um, been very different where people have locked down cities or regionally. 
And of course, as I mentioned, you can also assume that the model parameters vary by your spatial unit, so that you needn't have a constant model running across all of the country, which is a problem if you're doing sort of national level modeling. So what sort of computing resources were required? Uh, so when we uh, at least set it up, uh, one simulation done, of the sort of minimum of a thousand replicates, probably took around 12 hours on your standard desktop, uh, something like a, a 10 or an eight core machine, with a further six hours to post process the data. And it was a, a, a fair chunk of data involved. The mobility matrices themselves um, were several gigs each, and you had to have one for each day. Uh, and the output themselves were, again, output at a ward level uh, for 1,000 replicates. So that took up a chunk of space. So how, uh, how did we do it on the CHPC? Um, so the first run was a model written entirely in R. Um, and R is uh, you know, the sort of preferred platform for most of the people working in the space, but it's not particularly efficient at the computation itself. So the code was optimized by implementing various components, in particular, the ODE solver in C++, and then calling it from inside R. Uh, we were able to run it on the CHPC. Uh, it took a bit of uh, a steep learning curve, but the, uh, the team managed that to, with the very um, welcome assistance of the CHPC team. We're able to run it in parallel over 240 processes for a single run. And that took about one and a half hours for a single simulation run, including post-processing. So a fairly significant speed up over what we would have uh, implemented uh, just on a single machine. And in addition, using the CHPC allowed us to efficiently set up and run a, a very large set of scenarios so that we could uh, predict what would happen and under a range of circumstances. Some of the results from uh, the work. Firstly, we were able to demonstrate that the spatial variability is important and interesting, and that we had the capability to implement spatial models and generate the sort of outputs required. One of the key things that pitched up early on is that models without a spatial component overestimate the peak of level of infection by about 20 percent and they also underestimate the duration of uh, the infection uh, at a national level. So in other words they have a higher and narrower curve for, for the number of infected and at a spatial level, we'd see a much flatter curve, significantly flatter by about 20%, but also would stretch out for much longer. The, the outputs from this were fed into uh, the national models and they were used uh, in the simulations mapped by the CSR art. They were able to map those on the GIS platform. One of the questions that we had, of course, was would we be able to predict just based on movement patterns where the infection would spread. And there are some reasonably good results, uh, a sort of 60 percent accuracy of whether an infection would spread to a particular ward based on the existing distribution. Um, and there are uh, several publications that uh, are in preparation at the moment. This sort of bundling had limited value as a real-time modeling tool. And that's partially just because of uh, sort of capacity limitations within the national response. I think there was initially some appetite for regional variations, and there were certainly provinces who were calling for, for regional variations. Um, but um, you know, given the demands, the bureaucracy, uh, none of that actually came to pass. There is a problem with the SEIR models generally, though. Um, so just to give you a sense here that one of the key uh, unknowns that you have to um, input into this model 
is the split between the people who are immune, naturally immune. And we know that there is that proportion because of previous variants of the coronavirus. People who are asymptomatic and the people who are at the various uh, levels of uh, symptomatic, whether it's a mild or severe. There's vari variation in the value of R0 and RT, you know, the initial uh, rate of spread and the rate of spread over time. And there's uncertainty about the estimates of the effect of various levels of interventions, you know, what the difference is between lockdown and level one and level two, et cetera. And at least with the spatial model, we had some good estimates of what the, the effect was on, on actual movement. One of the difficulties is that even if you were running a model not at a national level, you can have very different models that can give you very good matches with observed data for an extended period of time before diverging. And what you're doing here is you're modeling a disease that we haven't seen before. So there is no or very little past information to, to build on. And so this uncertainty just spreads throughout your, your, your modeling and you can have very wide error ranges in your numbers and that's not usually what the decision makers are all too keen on seeing. But to give you just one example, uh, that little green line uh, you can plot was the actual number of cumulative positive tests. And you had two very different models, the red and blue lines. And both of those for a very long time matched what were able to give you a very good match to the observed data. But they end up in very different places. And that's just because you have a large set of parameters to choose from. And if you're calibrating on observed data, you have a very large number of potential solutions. And that means that you're basically up against the wall as far as long-term predictions for where you end up uh, go. Um, in addition to, of course, the uncertainties about um, what the effect of the non-pharmaceutical interventions are, et cetera. So in real time, the models, I think, were less than useful. They, they gave people some indication of what was going to happen, but it was very difficult to use them for active planning purposes. And of course, now we're seeing something approaching a second wave, uh, at least in parts of the country. There's an expectation that that will spread. Um, so we're going to have another look at to see to what extent uh, relaxing observance on the social distancing uh, after an extended period of observance will have. Um, but in the end, I think we were able to produce outputs and we're able to analyze them. Uh, and we're able to show that, as I said, these uh, spatial models were, we were able to do them and they were able to produce a useful output. I'll end there. Thank you very much. I should have put on my camera, I suppose. Hi, Saeed, do you have a camera? Is your camera? Yes, I should actually do that, sorry. <laughs> yes, no, thank you very much, Zaid. Um, and also, I think in the end, it was a bit unprepared if you wanted to do a pre-recording, but we appreciate you also adjusting to the times quickly. Yes, no problem. <laughs> um, Yes, uh, we, we are, of course, a little bit short of time because we started late, but let's deal with one um, question or comment, and I will read it to you now. And this is from, from Finn Reynolds. You may see it there on your side as well. He says, thank you, Zahid, a fascinating glimpse inside the world of epidemic modeling, which it certainly is. You mentioned that you, you work down to ward level. Would you get substantially more accuracy in these models if you used even finer spatial resolution? I suppose it is an accuracy versus computational cost trade-off in addition to challenges obtaining accurate data for very small regions. Maybe you can just respond to that. Yeah, now certainly at, at the ward level, it's still quite a large chunk of space. And 
what often happens with the spread of diseases like this is that it happens in clusters. And if those clusters are finer than the resolution, your spatial resolution, then you don't have much of a chance of modeling. You know, if it happens at an old age home or prison, that's a very you know, minor part of a ward. And that limits the extent to which you're able to extrapolate from uh, that sort of data. So certainly you would want to go down to much finer levels. Um, I think there are 23,000 voting districts uh, and 110,000 enumerated areas. So that would be very useful. Again, you have very good data at that level. You have data on people, the number of people, the age structure, et cetera. But it becomes a lot more difficult to do the computation. Um, you know, we're talking about four or five hours then, even running from, from 240 cores. And that uh, just becomes unwieldy. Uh, and certainly if you went down to the sort of deluxe model where you had an agent-based model, uh, you'd be talking about a couple of weeks of, of running time before you get results. And that, you know, for a single run, and that would make any analysis very difficult. So it's a trade-off between doing something reasonably quickly and doing something more accurately. Yeah, no, fully understood. I can maybe just mention to the benefit of the audience, it was in March this year that Zahid contacted the CHPC and you will re remember March was when the lockdown started and he said he urgently needs the, the computational access. And we were very keen to set him up and we are very pleased that you are able to report back on, let's say a, a role that the CHPC could play in this very important work. So thank you very much, Zahid. And we appreciate also for you um, uh, agreeing to do this talk. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Um, yes, so I mentioned that the chair of the session, uh, Dr. Daniel Moeketsi, uh, struggled in the beginning, but he did join us in the meantime. So, Daniel, I'm going to hand over to you for the introduction of the next speaker. Thank you, Daniel. Um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Vena, for standing in for me when I had um, technical, pro technical problems to connect. So without um, wasting your time, I will introduce the, the second speaker of this session. So his name is Dr. Ian Haywood from South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. He's also a student at uh, Rhodes University and Oxford University. So this presentation will be about a new view of the center of our galaxy, which may cut. So, for more about this bio, you can read it on, online, so I don't have time for that. So over to Ian. Thank you, Daniel. Can you all hear me okay? Can we, you? Can hear, we can hear perfectly. Excellent, thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, Perfect. Can you see okay. my slides there? 100%. You're good to go, Dr. Hayward. Great, thanks. I'll, I'll disable my video while I'm speaking. Um, okay, uh, thank you for attending. Um, so yeah, I'm going to present um, some new observations of the centre of our own galaxy with, made with the Meerkat radio telescope. Um, I present this work on behalf of essentially everybody who has made Meerkat happen. Um, this is a, a, a very large team of very capable and dedicated uh, individuals, mostly from South Africa, who have, who have devised and built this telescope over the last decade or so. Uh, too numerous to mention, although I do say that um, any errors in my talk are mine and mine alone. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak. Um, I'd like to start with, with a confession, essentially, which is that um, I'm much more of a radio astronomer than an HPC person. Um, I've been thrust headfirst into the world of HPC because of the capability of modern radio telescopes such as MIRCAP. Um, that's an aspect that I'm hopefully going to um, elaborate more on during the course of my talk, as well as introducing you to, to MIRCAP itself. Um, but since it's a, an HPC conference, not a radio astronomy conference, I'd, I'd also like to start with a brief introduction of radio astronomy just to, just to frame um, the work that we're doing with telescopes such as MIRCAP. Um, so if you look up at the night sky with your eyes, which are sensitive to a wavelength of around 380 to 750 nanometers, um, in a very good dark sky spot, you, you may see a picture such as this. Um, so astronomy is basically you know, standing at the center of a sphere and looking at the, the inner surface of that sphere and trying to figure out what is going on in the universe by receiving the light here on Earth. 
Um, so even with your naked eye, you'll be able to look at a, a good image of the night sky like this and say a few things about where we are in the universe. So the horizontal banding here is the disk of our own galaxy. You can see that there's clouds of dust in it that obscure the view through the galaxy. Um, and you can see all of these little dots in the picture, which are, which are stars. Of course, we don't do astronomy these days with, with just our eyes. We use technology and modern instrumentation. Um, and that allows us to basically gather um, information about the sky at a range of wavelengths and conduct um, astrophysics you know, uh, analyses on, on, on the information that we receive. Um, for example, if you tune your view of the sky to a specific wavelength of, of hydrogen light here at 656 nanometers, you see a very different picture. So this light traces um, essentially nebulae in, in our galaxy, uh, moving down in wavelength even further. So this is 350 micron uh, microwave emission from I think the Planck satellite. You see here a very clear view of all of the dust that I was uh, talking about earlier at high and low galactic latitudes. And then moving down further still into, into the kind of wavelength that I primarily deal with. So this is radio wavelengths. Um, you can now see the plane of our galaxy here shining very brightly, but this light penetrates clear through all of that dust, all of that obscuring dust, um, gives us a very clear view of, of the universe. Um, here it's revealed to be uh, a very bright radio source in the center of our own galaxy here in the middle of the plane. Um, and I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, but I'm, I'm highlighting a few of the dots above and below the plane here, which are essentially radio emission coming from very, very distant supermassive black holes at the hearts of other galaxies. Um, so the key equation to bear in mind here is on the slide here, which is theta equals lambda over d. Um, this is just the classic diffraction equation that tells you that the, the finest detail you can see with the telescope is related to the wavelength lambda divided by the diameter of that telescope. I've noticed on, noted on this slide that at this point I'm at a wavelength that's about a million times longer than the hydrogen alpha wavelength. So if I want to see comparable detail, I have to build a telescope that's a million times a million times uh, wider. <clears throat> uh, so the, the principles of radio astronomy are, are fairly simple, to be honest. Um, you basically have to build a, an antenna. So a simple dipole antenna will receive electromagnetic radiation and that electromagnetic radiation will induce a current in that antenna that you can then measure. So if you take such an antenna and on the left here, you can see uh, um, a, a very large radio telescope, the Lovell telescope in the UK. If you, if you place that antenna at the focus of a big paraboloid, then you can basically gather lots of radio light in this big light bucket, focus it on your antenna and measure the brightness of the radio sky by, <clears throat> by steering this antenna. So as I mentioned, because we're dealing at a very long, much longer wavelength, you have to use a much bigger dish um, to give you a sense of scale on the right of this, this large dish here, you can see a five story building. Um, and obviously this becomes impractical at some point. So uh, you can't keep building bigger and bigger telescopes. It just becomes too much of an engineering challenge. So back in the seventies or so, this technique of radio interferometry was pioneered where you essentially split your collecting area up into lots of smaller dishes, as you can see on the right here and spread them out on the ground. Uh, and if you can record those signals and then, and then um, gather them and, and, and combine them properly, then you can, you can synthesize a telescope that is much larger than uh, the single dish that you could that you could uh, each sorry the single dishes that make up the telescope and getting to the size of um, you know kilometers in diameter effectively to give you high resolution imaging. Uh, so here's one arm of the VLA. Uh, this is a useful picture because all the telescopes are in a row and it's handy to explain some stuff. Um, when you see a telescope like this, you may, may be tempted to think of all of these receptors as pixels in a camera laid out on the ground, but um, actually, it's the technique's a little different. So the fundamental measurement comes from aver averaging the signals from pairs of antennas over some short time interval. So the signals from all of these dishes go into a machine called the correlator, and that multiplies each pair together and gives you a fundamental measurement. And this fundamental measurement is called the visibility, and it's just one complex number. And this complex number represents one Fourier component of the radio brightness distribution of the sky. So it has an amplitude, which encodes the strength of the signal, and a phase term, which encodes something about its structure. So in a telescope like this, the shorter baselines see large scales in the radio, the longer baselines see finer details. Uh, and when you combine all of them together, you get n into n minus one baseline pairs. So for the full array of 27 antennas, you get 351 baseline pairs. And basically this machine lets you gather lots and lots of information about the Fourier transform of the radio sky. You use earth rotation to change the orientation of these baselines and thus the Fourier components that are sampled. Um, and this then allows you to make an image from these measurements, which I'll, I'll come on to shortly. The data rate is essentially governed by the number of baselines, the number of uh, spectral frequency channels, the number of polarizations, and how long you're observing for. So for a modern interferometer, the number of baselines could be of order 1,000. Uh, the number of channels could be of order tens of thousands. Uh, the number of polarizations is generally just four. 
and basically your observing time divided by your integration time, which is how often your correlator clock ticks, is also about a thousand. So for a modern radio observation uh, spanning several hours, you basically get hundreds of billions of, of visibility measurements. Uh, the, the key point then is to basically take these billions of measurements, put them onto a 2D grid and do a Fourier transform. Um, on the left, you can see a gridded visibility amplitudes and on the right, the corresponding image that you get from the Fourier transform of that. Um, and then essentially you do a, a deconvolution process to take care of the, the fact that we've got this incomplete aperture and then hopefully recover uh, an image of the, of the radio sky as if you had super radio vision. So here you can see 3C31, which is a, a distant supermassive black hole that has jets of radio emission coming from it. So I am glossing over a lot here. Um, the basic process that you have to do to, to get to this image involves a few prior steps. So I'll just go over these quickly. There's uh, flagging, which is the removal of this unwanted interference, mainly from satellites. Um, this can be parallelized by baseline. So every telescope pair can be treated um, as a time frequency um, object in individually. Uh, of course, the instrument itself needs calibrating. This is the correction for instrumental effects. So essentially the gains of these receivers might be drifting. And then when you multiply the the signals together, the, the, the product is corrupted by that drift. And also propagation effects as the radio waves travel through the atmosphere, um, the ionosphere and the troposphere affect, affect the propagation of the signals. Um, this process is partially parallelizable up to the time and frequency solution interval that you have to solve over, um, but all baselines are generally required. Uh, and then finally imaging, which I just touched on, which is what compensates for these missing spatial scales, transforms the data into a, a domain that we're more familiar with as astronomers and, and as humans. Um, and this is partially parallelizable. So you can, you can split up the deconvolution, for example, um, you can parallelize the gridding process. Um, but the two things that dominate the computing in any of this are basically the data volume. So these new machines produce a terrifying amount of data. Um, you have to read that data, visibilities need conditioning during the gridding, you may have to do a corner turn operation. And also the ratio of the field of view of the telescope, which is for an interferometer governed by the size of any one of its individual dishes, um, to its resolution, which is governed by the maximum separation of these dishes. Uh, this basically governs the size of the grid that you need to do a Fourier transform on. So to give you some, some real world examples, this is an observation that I worked on about a decade ago. So this is from the VLA, which I was uh, talking about a, a minute ago. Um, the raw measurements here clocked in at about 232 gigabytes. Um, and the final science product here was about four megabytes. So this is a reduction factor of about 58,000. So I, I basically copied this data to my computer and processed it bit by bit. And you know, in 2010, uh, this was just about doable. Um, a recent observation I've been working on from, from Meerkat, which is a 2020 observation, uh, the measurements for this clocked in at about 130 terabytes, uh, a science product of about half a, half a gigabyte or so. So a larger reduction factor of about 32,000. So this is now very much not a desktop size problem, right? I need a, I need a bigger boat. <clears throat> Aficionados will probably be screaming at me to point out a few caveats here. The science product size, of course, does change depending on what your science application is. Um, you know, it, it can get a lot larger than 407 megabytes. Uh, but I, I just wanted to put these up to give you a, a ballpark feel for the scale of the problem. So radio interferometry has always had a big data problem, but it's only getting bigger. So Meerkat is the precursor instrument to something called the square kilometer array mid. Um, this will have 192 of, of uh, these, these antennas. Um, this gives about 18,000 baselines, so a data rate that's nine times higher than, than Meerkat. Um, its angular resolution is also 16 times higher, meaning that the FFT grids need to be about 256 times larger. Um, so we're going from this, this regime where, in, you know, in 2010, I could just about take the data home and process it. In 2020, I have to make use of general purpose HPC PC facilities, such as uh, the CHPC and IDEA each of which are, are situated in South Africa with fast links to the telescope. Um, I'm using these to essentially learn how to do most of the processing and you know, take home a, a reduced data product to go and write nice papers on. Uh, but we're moving into a regime now for, for things like the SKA where all of the processing needs to be done on some yet to be decided infallible software pipeline on a dedicated HPC facility that's attached to the telescope. So we're kind of in this, in this limbo phase at the moment where we're we're using HPC to, to deal with the data, but um, still kind of finding our feet, I think that's fair to say, at least I am. <clears throat> um, yeah. So an introduction to Meerkat itself. Um, Meerkat is situated here in the Northern Cape province uh, in the Karoo Desert. Uh, you can see why the radio telescope was built here and indeed why South Africa has a natural geographic advantage to host such a, a sensitive machine. Um, this map shows you population density, so in the same way as with optical astronomy, you want to get away from artificial sources of light to see the, 
the night sky in the, in the best way that you can. The same is true for radio, although it's not street lights we're worried about in this case, it's, it's artificial radio signals, cell phones, you know, petrol engine spark plugs, et cetera, et cetera. These devices are extremely sensitive and radio signals from space are extremely faint. So you really have to go out to a, a good site to, to build these machines. Um, if you fly over the, the site now, you'll, you'll see this wonderful site, which is all 64 of Meerkat's dishes are now there in, 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 in this region. Um, for those of us who've been involved in the project for a while and have been used to CGI renderings, this is a wonderful site to see the, the real hardware there. Um, zooming in a bit, you can see the, the density of these dishes um, and you can see that uh, these things are essentially each dish has this uh, 13 and a half meter primary reflector with this offset Gregorian optics design. Um, three receivers here at, at these frequency ranges, UHF, uh, ultra high frequency is actually the lowest frequency, um, L band and pending S band. Um, it's L band that I'll be talking about later on. Um, and I showed you the Y shaped layout of the VLA. You can see that the Meerkat layout is very different. So 70% of the collecting area is within a kilometer with a maximum diameter baseline of about eight kilometers, um, buying you typically a resolution of about six to eight arc seconds on the sky. So if you remember from earlier when I said that these short spacings are sensitive to large angular scales on the sky, you can see the density of dishes in the core of Meerkat gives this thing lots and lots of short spacings. So Meerkat is a very, very excellent imaging device for doing radio imaging of the sky. It has 2016 baselines from its 64 antennas um, and basically has a phenomenal range of spatial scales that it can cover. It's a very capable spectrograph. It has 32,000 channels that it can deliver as a maximum. Um, if you remember my little data rate equation, then you can see why this all adds up. Um, and it is, as I said, a very sensitive machine. Uh, these are rather esoteric units for radio astronomers, but the, the bottom line here that when it was designed, it was um, committed to be constructed and it turns out to be a factor of 1.7 more sensitive than it, than it was on paper, which you know, rarely happens and is, is wonderful and a uh, good testament to the, to the very smart people who built this thing. To give you a comparison of how sensitive it is compared to the VLA, each of the Meerkat's 13 and a half meter dishes is about as sensitive as one of the VLA's 25 meter dishes. So there are 64 of these in Meerkat versus 27 in the VLA. Um, and the fact that this has half the diameter buys you a fourfold increase in the field of view of the machine. Um, I illustrate this not to uh, disparage the VLA in any way. It's one of the most productive ground-based observatories of all time. It's a machine that's very close to my heart and it has capabilities that Meerkat still can't do. Um, but I do highlight it to show you that, you know, the, the advances in technology since the VLA was built have really delivered a, an amazingly sensitive machine. Um, you know, the, the most capable radio telescope of, the, of its kind in the world is, is right there in South Africa. <clears throat> Just to highlight some relevant infrastructure um, uh, before I move on to talking about the Galactic Center finally. Um, so the telescope hardware, the dishes are out, out there in the crew. Um, that is next to a machine called the correlator, which is what takes all these pair, pairwise uh, cross correlations of the radio dishes. Um, there's some on-site infrastructure that, that processes the data and makes quick look images. Um, and then these come down to, uh, to the Cape Town area via links um, into a long-term storage archive, which I believe is hosted in the same building as, as, as CHPC's Langau cluster. And also the Elif, uh, Lifu Idea facility, which is an, another massive compute cluster, which many users, uh, including myself, are using um, to process to process Meerkat data. So as an end user of the telescope, you know, instead of taking the data from the correlator and dumping it straight on your computer, you have this kind of HPC layer now, which mercifully exists because, well, as astronomers, we'd be kind of sunk otherwise. Um, but this is kind of what you interact with as an end user. You request data from the archive, you ship it to one of these two HPC facilities, um, you conduct your large scale heavy lifting processing there, and then you extract a, a, redu a much reduced science product that you then take to your, your home institute. <clears throat> okay, so on to the Galactic Center. Um, it's easy to start at the beginning with the Galactic Center because uh, the pioneer of radio astronomy, which is uh, a chap called Karl Jansky, um, our unit of, of, of brightness and flux density is named after, after Karl Jansky, the Jansky. Um, so he was an engineer for Bell Labs um, telecommunications company. And, and back in the 1930s, he was trying to determine the origin of some very mysterious interference in, in transatlantic radio communications. Um, and he built, built an old, uh, built a, a rotating dipole antenna uh, on top of kind of a circular turntable that he could you know, use to vaguely point on the sky using some old wheels from a Model T Ford, some two by four and some, and some bits of wire. He essentially 
kick-started the entire subject of radio astronomy. And it turns out that uh, the source of this mysterious interference, which um, he managed to deduce was coming from, from far, far away from the Earth because of the rotation with the sidereal time rather than uh, the rotation of the Earth itself. So this thing was fixed to the, the background of the stars was actually coming from the direction of the center of our, of our own galaxy. So the very first detection in radio astronomy was from the center of our galaxy. And Jansky published this finding in, in 1933 in this paper with a rather terrifying title, Electrical Disturbances Apparently of Extraterrestrial Origin. Um, I think the first radio astronomer proper was a chap called Grote Reber who, who built a, a similar parabolic antenna to um, the ones we use today uh, next to his mother's backyard in Wheaton, Illinois. And um, uh, Reber actually made multi-frequency maps of much of the radio sky, in, including confirming Jansky's detection and mapping the plane of our own galaxy in radio waves. Um, <clears throat> and since then, it's basically been a case of building bigger and better instruments and making you know, finer and nicer maps of, of this region of the sky. So, you know, I've jumped, I've jumped 60 years of, of instrumental development at this point to this map that you see here, which was uh, published in 2000. This is, to my mind, one of the most iconic radio images ever. This is a, a 90 centimeter map of the center of our galaxy. Um, diagonally here, you can see the plane of our galaxy plus many unique features seen only in the radio, supernova remnants, these weird threads, some more supernovae down here, as well as a very bright source of radio emission coming from the very center. So we now know that the center of our galaxy hosts a, a supermassive black hole with a mass of about 4 million suns. Uh, this has been directly inferred from um, many pieces of observational evidence. My favorite is probably this one, which is monitoring stellar orbits around the galactic center over about 25 years with the, an op uh, optical infrared telescope called Keck. Um, and basically by modeling these orbits, you can infer that there is some unseen mass there that weighs 4 million suns. Um, one of these stars actually whips around at about two and a half percent the speed of light. You know, that one, I think, uh, coming close enough to the black hole to be about four times the distance to Neptune. I think this is it's truly terrifying when you think about it, but absolutely amazing data. Um, this is one of the results or, or similar to this that shared the 2020 Nobel Prize for Physics for the discovery of this supermassive black hole. So as I said at the start of my talk, radio waves let you peer clear through the dust. So radio is a very good way to study the the, the center of, of our galaxy. Um, you can see from the image on the left here that there's lots going on. So um, the, center of, the center of the galaxy is not only a good target if you're interested in astrophysics, um, supermassive black holes, how supermassive black holes affect the evolution of galaxies, um, many, many astrophysical applications that you can do with these data. But the center of the galaxy is also an excellent thing to point a new telescope at because it's quite a tough part of the sky to observe. So in 2018, Meerkat observed the center of the galaxy as part of its commissioning phase. Um, resulting in this rather spectacular image that was produced for the telescope's inauguration. So highly saturated in the middle here, you see the center of our own galaxy. Um, you can see these mysterious threads, these filaments, supernova shells, many, many things here. Uh, in 2019, some bipolar radio bubbles were discovered in, in, in these data. So you can see a larger scale image on the right here. So um, Meerkat's fantastic imaging capability allowed us to find these, these two bubbles blowing up um, above and below the, the plane of our galaxy. Um, these are about 1400 light years end to end, um, the inference being that they were caused by an explosive event in the galactic center several million years ago. Um, and the image here on the right was made from, from just four pointings um, of, of, the, of the commissioning survey of the galactic center. So um, coming to what we've been up to lately with this data. So in 2020, we are presenting some high resolution and consistently processed, um, you know, not rushed for an inauguration, but consistently and carefully processed. Uh, um, images derived from 20 of these pointings. Um, this clocks in at about 200 hours of observations. Um, and as I said, each of these pointings must be flagged, calibrated and imaged. Um, so I've been using CHPC for this process. Uh, this typical each pointing occupies a single node for about 48 hours. So serial processing of these data would take about 40 days. So what Lengau has been brilliant for in this work is that um, not only can you basically give it pointings and have them processed in parallel and get to a multiple pointing result in a couple of days rather than a month, um, but it's actually been very, very useful for me to, to optimize the workflow. So um, we're, we're doing these observations to basically, you know, get out of the science, but also because it's a new telescope, we need to make sure that the telescope's behaving as it should. Um, but also it's new territory for me as a radio astronomer because these data are so much larger than anything else I've ever dealt with. Um, and I think that's true for anyone who's using Meerkat. 
um, we need to make sure that you know we're 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 processing the data in an optimal way. And having access to a large compute facility has actually really helped that process because it, it gets you to where you need to be just faster fundamentally. And it's 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 been I would say essential in, in doing this. Um, we're kind of using off-the-shelf uh, software packages. Um, these are containerized with with Singularity. Um, most of the software packages that you use in radio astronomy are designed by radio astronomers, and uh, they may have things such as um, internal parallelism that works on a single node, but they generally aren't built with HPC environments in mind with kind of multiple node parallelism. So the, the, the speed up here really comes from the parallel processing of, of multiple nodes, uh, multiple pointings in the survey. Um, rather than um, distributing any of those flagging calibration or imaging jobs over multiple nodes. Um, software is heading more in this direction now out of necessity. Um, I think Brad Frank is talking tomorrow and he knows much more about this than I do and we'll, we'll probably be able to give you a, um, more of an insight into how that's, that's moving. Um, but basically uh, what I did is I, I got some Python code that handles the dependencies for where I can parallelize it. And, and this code then generates PBS scripts, which invoke singularity, which invoke basically underlined containerized pieces of, of off the shelf uh, radio astronomy code um, at the risk of exposing myself as a terrible programmer. Um, the code that I used to, um, to do this is, is available here. Um, and there's also links there to all of the other software packages that I used, which are, you know, far more important than my shoddy Python layer. Uh, these are the actual packages that are doing the heavy lifting, such as imaging and calibration. So in the last uh, couple of minutes that I have, I'll, I'll give you a, an exclusive tour of what we're seeing in this new data. So the, the, the gray map here is, you know, not as spectacular as the nice orange one that I showed that was for the inauguration, but I assure you there is uh, much nicer things to be seen in it. Um, so we can have a little zoom around this now, so I'll just show you some of the sites. Uh, this is one of my favorite objects, this is called the mouse. So um, the circular feature that you can see on the upper right of the image here is a, is a supernova remnant. So when a massive star ends its life um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large explosion, it blows off its outer layers into one of these shells. And the remnant of the star in this case is what's called a neutron star, um, and because of the explosion proceeds in, a, in an asymmetric way, this, the neutron star that's left over at the end of the day can actually be kicked out of the system. And that's that's what you're seeing here. So you've got the, the shell from the dead star over here, and then what's left is, is pinging out in this direction to start a new life somewhere else as a, as a radio pulsar. Um, if you time the tip of this, you see um, pulses from the rapidly rotating neutron star, and you can you can see the what's called the pulsar wind nebula around it here. Um, upper right here, you can see one of these, one of these threads, one of these filaments. Um, a closer look at this one, it's called uh, colloquially the snake. Um, these things are still a bit of a mystery since they were discovered about 35 years ago. Uh, the, the, the process of how you get something so long and coherent and stable is, is still not really well understood and there are many competing theories. Um, I think what's common to all of these theories is that the, the radio emission that you see here is being driven by um, charged particles, probably electrons moving close to the speed of light that are getting bound to a magnetic field line in the center of a galaxy and emitting this synchrotron light. Um, <clears throat> I'll come on to some more views of filaments in a second, but I just want to point out this thing that's ringed here. This is the ridiculously named Great Annihilator. Um, these are actually jets from an X-ray binary system. So uh, binary stars with a compact object and, a, and an evolved star companion. Um, the compact object accretes material from its companion star and, and then shoots out these jets of material in opposite directions. It's, it's very nice to just be able to see see such things in these data. Um, I think Patrick is also talking tomorrow. We will probably be talking about um, these things in more detail. Um, and yeah, what Meerkat has really given us is, in, 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 is many things, but I think it's afforded us the best ever view of these, of these radio filaments. Um, you can see some here below the galactic plane. The galactic plane is running diagonally here. Uh, these are to the south. Uh, and then again to the north, you can, you can almost see the the alignment of these things is is at right angles to the galactic plane. It's like the the whole center of the galaxy is just blowing this constant wind wind of material away from it, as material falls into the this highly energetic region and then gets expelled out by by supernova processes and also processes associated with um, material falling onto the supermassive black hole. Um, this boundary here marks the edge of the of the makeup bubbles. So very very pleased with the quality of this imaging and 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 how this is all this has all come out. Uh, finally, the super bubble 
the so-called super bubble and, and the Sagittarius A star complex itself. You can see the most famous filament complex here known as the radio arc. And then if I kind of desaturate this white area, you can see uh, the compact radio source in the middle of this circular image here is actually Sagittarius A star itself. This is the, the point radio source that marks the position of the central supermassive black hole um, and is the same point radio source that we saw in the center of that, um, that purple image right at the, at the beginning. Um, and you can see the wild environment that, that surrounds the black hole here revealed in the radio. Um, the well-known mini spiral here that possibly uh, indicates material falling in along, along uh, accretion flows. Um, and finally, hot off the press, um, I did this this weekend. So this is taking advantage of the fact that Meerkat has this spectral capability. So um, I've essentially imaged the, the galactic sensor data in 16 different subbands, and I picked three of these at the lower, middle, and upper end of the band and just made some RGB images. Um, so this is, this is a completely new reprocessing of these data in addition to the high resolution. We're taking advantage of the spectral capability now to make these false color radio images. Um, on the right, you can see Sagittarius B2, a star forming region. Um, and you can actually see some of these compact sources. The ones below this kind of cloud are, are slightly redder than the, the white and the blue ones above. And this shows you the different radio spectrum that these, these sources have. So the red ones, these are fading as you go to higher frequencies and the blue ones are rising as you go to higher frequencies. So you can immediately see from these data alone the, the different physical processes that are giving rise to the radio emission in, in these objects. Um, and then on the left, we have Sagittarius A star region itself. Um, and that mini spiral that I mentioned pops right out there in blue. This is a, this is a real feature. It kind of looks like the image has uh, been saturated a little weird, but this is actually genuine. So these blue sources that you see here have very different radio spectra to the, to the surrounding emission. So there's, yeah, there's, there's more in these data than one person can possibly analyze. So um, the conclusion is that uh, we've essentially completed now, thanks to CHPC resources and, and others that uh, the reprocessing of these data now ahead of a, a full public release of these data to the community, um, probably early next year. So hopefully we'll start to see these data being exploited to the full. Um, yeah, I thank you very much for your attention and for the invitation to speak to you. And I'm happy to take questions either now or you, if you want to email me, if you want to talk to me about any of this after, please feel free to do so. Um, thanks, Ian, for a very interesting talk about the background of radio astronomy and essential development doing with MECAD and also using the CSPC. So I'm not going to allow any questions now. So Whoever has a question, can you refer to the Q&A, then Ian will directly um, answer you. I'm sorry for this, is because of the, the time constraints. So in conclusion, I will, would like to thank all the speakers of the session. I now hand over to the program director. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mukliti. Um, so we are going to take a quick body break. So go grab yourself a cup of coffee and we'll be back at quarter past three. We, we will then have a presentation by Professor Rebecca Garland and Mr. Ndumiso Mtembu. So we'll start again at quarter past three. <laughs>
Hello, Charles. Hello, Dorso. It's Cornei. Hi. <laughs> so our first speaker is Rebecca, and I think she's online as well. And if I am correct, Rebecca will do a screen share and presentation from her side as well. Yes, I will. Thank you. Perfect. You're ready, you're ready to roll, Rebecca. Yes, I am. How are you, Charles? I am very well, indeed. Good. Okay. So we'll start exactly at quarter past, so that we don't run over our time again. Rebecca, I mean, you've got your 20 minutes, um, with some 10 minutes left after that for some questions and answers at the end. Um, I see we've got Mugesh online as well, and he'll probably assist you with some questions and answers. Um, so you could just click on the little Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And um, there's still two questions being answered by Dr. Ian. Um, so once that is done, then we can answer questions from there to Rebecca and Mugesh can assist as well. Great, thank you. Perfect, so we've got two minutes to go, then we'll be live again. Okay. everyone and thank you and uh, welcome to the afternoon uh, session in the um, HPC applications. It is my privilege to introduce our first uh, presenter, Dr. Rebecca Garland. She is a CSIR uh, colleague um, working in the uh, CSIR climate and air quality modeling group. Um, she'll be presenting this afternoon to, together with Nagesh Naidu. Uh, the topic of the talk is simulation of atmospheric composition and air quality on the CHPC. Okay. Thanks, Charles. Could you confirm that you're seeing the correct view, the, 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 the large slide, the full? I can confirm that hearing you loud and clear and I'm seeing your presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity today to talk on our work that we do on the CHPC on the simulation of atmosphere composition and air quality. And this is a presentation of work that myself and Megesh Naidu at the CSIR. Um, so we're in the CSIR Climate and Air Quality Modeling Group, as Charles noted, and a goal of this, this group is to provide strong analyses and a scientific basis for decision makers to use in policy making and management decisions. And this includes in air quality work, climate change work, the linkages between air quality and climate change, as well as the impacts. But today I'll focus only on our air quality modeling. We have a list of some of the work that we do here. I think you can see my pointer. And the air quality work that we do is mostly regional and urban air quality modeling, mostly in South Africa right now. Um, climate and air quality linkages, as I noted before, as well as impacts on poor air quality. So before we start, just a high level view of air quality and atmospheric science. Today, I'll be focusing on ambient air pollution, and ambient is outdoor, so I won't talk about indoor and household air pollution. This schematic is quite simple, but it shows that there's quite a lot of different sources of pollutants. It also highlights that there are primary pollutants. These are the pollutants that are emitted directly into the atmosphere, and then there are secondary pollutants as well, and these are the ones that are formed in the atmosphere from chemistry. In South Africa, a lot of our pollution that I'll talk about today are from particulate matter or PM, which can be primary or secondary, ground level ozone, so this is tropospheric ozone um, and near surface ozone, which is a secondary pollutant, which is formed only by chemistry in the atmosphere. I'll also talk a little bit about nitrogen dioxide or NO2. It itself is a pollutant and it impacts health and it also is a precursor for ozone. So there's a lot of complex processes and drivers. You can see the emission sources emit many places within the troposphere. But if you see the little guy turning here at the bottom, if we care about health, we actually care about what's at the ground level. So today I will talk a little bit about what's in the column, so across all of the troposphere, but also ground, ground level or near surface. If I had to sum up South African pollution in one sentence, it would be complex and varied sources and particularly for the high felt, very unfortunate meteorology. And this is particularly true in our winter where we have stagnant conditions and pollution accumulates. But before I go into that, I just wanted to talk a bit about why we study air quality. So in South Africa, air quality is regulated in order to protect human health. And the health impacts from air quality are quite wide ranging. I um, mean, it depends upon the pollutants. 
In general, it has impacts across the respiratory and cardiovascular system, and more work is showing across many more systems as well. Um, globally, air pollution is considered, is, the, is estimated to be the top environmental risk health factor um, for premature mortality. Um, so it has a very large impact on health in South Africa and also globally. It also can impact ecosystems and agriculture. So ecosystems can be impacted by the deposition of pollutants. Very often we think of the acidic species here and acid rain and such. Also ozone, as I noted, that was a secondary pollutant. It also can impact on ecosystems and agricultural on plants. We can see over here to the right hand side, this is a leaf that shows some flecking. And this is due to ozone exposure. And if this happens to agricultural crops, like maize, for example, the growth rate can be reduced and we can also have decreasing yields then. So the question very comes quickly is what is the air quality in Africa then? We know that it can have impacts. How bad is the problem in Africa? So what I'm showing here is just a screenshot I took the other day from OpenAQ. OpenAQ is a source of open access data, um, air quality data across the world. You can see there's very few points in Africa. This is not all of the measurements that there are on the continent. For example, in South Africa, we have quite a few monitoring stations and none of only one are shown here. And that's just because our data is not yet open access with programmatic access so it can be scraped onto this um, platform. However, even some more points in South Africa are not going to change this picture very much. We have very little information about air quality across the continent. However, we do still have estimates of its impact. And global estimates use a hybrid um, using satellite information, measurements, and models to create a gridded po um, pollution field. However, the, po the performance in Africa is uncertain, which I'm sure you can um, guess if there aren't many measurements to compare it to. And when we compare it to measurements in South Africa, we found that their performance is highly variable. But even though there are large uncertainties, there's still really worrying trends in air quality across the continent. I'm showing here some results from a recent-ish OECD report, which is premature health from the 1990s to 2013. So premature um, mor mortalities from different risk factors. So the first is the unsafe water in the dark blue, unsafe sanitation, childhood underweight and malnutrition, household air pollution, and ambient air pollution. And from 1990 to 2013, if we look at the region as a whole, the first three are decreasing. However, if we look at air pollution, the premature mortalities due to air pollution, both household and ambient, is seen to be increasing. So while we have uncertainties, there still is this very worrying trend. And if we look at air pollution in South Africa, um, we also have quite a problem with air pollution with many areas exceeding our national ambient air quality standard, which as I noted at the beginning is regulated due to health reasons. These are often driven by particulate matter and near surface ozone, which are impacted by atmospheric chemistry. And we haven't seen many improvements in our air quality. What I'm showing at the bottom in the map are three areas, are our three air quality priority areas in the country. These are priority areas due to the pollution levels and also they span across multiple provinces. So they do need um, concerted effort in order to improve air quality. The purple one is the Vol Triangle Air Pollution um, Priority Area. And that was a recent study that we did using our air quality model on the CHPC, the purple area is the same as this black outline. This is showing near surface ozone. I know you can't see the numbers, don't worry about that. <clears throat> the, what the red shows are all the areas that are out of compliance for ozone with our standards, basically the whole domain. <clears throat> and this wasn't actually a surprise. This is what we were expecting due to the measurements that are in the area. Another area of South Africa, um, another thing we are infamous for really is that we are one of the global hotspots for tropospheric NO2. This is using satellite. This was using the Skiamaki satellite. 
looking at tropospheric NO2, we can see that we have one of the global hotspots. The bottom is zoomed into South Africa over Hauteng and Mpumalanga. A source of NO2 is burning of fossil fuels, particularly in this region is our vehicles, our industry, and all of our coal-fired power stations. And as I noted before, NO2 is a pollutant in its own right. It's also a precursor to ozone, so it'll impact the ozone. So clearly we have a problem, we need to improve air quality, so how to do it? And so in order to do this, we look across the air quality impact pathway, which starts with the emissions of the pollutants. Um, then these pollutants, they're emitted into the air, they can be transported, they can be transformed through chemistry, and they end up at ambient concentration. So this is what's in the air. Then a receptor, a person, an ecosystem is exposed, and there is a resultant impact. Where we spend a lot of time in the analysis is looking at the concentrations and the exposure. And for this, if you're looking historical of what happened, of course, you can use multiple data streams. And we do use multiple data streams. You can use measurements. Um, these, of course, have very good, um, these are measuring reality. They're measuring at the site, but they are very expensive and they also have a limited, um, they're only representative of the area right around them. You can also use satellites, and we do use satellites, but satellites, when you look down from space down, you see the full column. And as we noted, for health impacts, you need to know what's at the ground. And then we also do use our air quality model as well, which of course also would have uncertainties. When you start to put these together, you start to understand what the ambient concentrations are. So that's one of the uses for the model that we run at CHPC. In addition, of course, uh, models can also be used to look at different scenarios. So if we want to look at the scenario where what impact will the green transport strategy, for example, have on emissions and ambient concentrations, we can use CAMEX for that as well. And we've used that in air quality management plans. Um, so if we we're just looking at the transport of pollutants, which is a dispersion model. We wouldn't need to use the CHPC. One of the main reasons we need to use the CHPC is we use a chemical transport model. And these work to try to, through some parameterizations and also through some you know, simulating of discrete chemical reactions, they try to represent the, the relevant atmosphere chemistry. And so what I've shown here is just you know, general kind of textbook tropospheric ozone chemistry, which then gets translated into a whole bunch of reactions. Um, we use carbon bond six. You can see the numbers of reactions here. And this is a very expensive component of air quality. However, many places, including South Africa, it is necessary because as I noted, our real sources of um, exceedances from our standard are ozone and particulate matter, which are impacted very, very strongly by atmospheric chemistry. So the model that we use is called CAMEX. Um, you can see at the very top here, this is a one day simulation just to show a nice animation of ozone. Um, this is simulated near surface ozone over the country. It'll peak during the middle of the day. So we run CAMEX on the CHPC. Um, it's a, chem a chemical transport model. It also has extensions for source tracking and process analyses, which again make quite, can make it quite computationally expensive. It is an open source model written in Fortran and uses the MPI. We run it on various scales. At the bottom are some examples of recent parent domains for recent studies. So you can see so far we've run it nationally, also in an urban, also just uh, an urban one. Um, our resolutions, the spatial resolution within can range from one to six kilometers. And it's the scale and the spatial resolution, as well as the temporal resolution. We run hourly, we have output hourly, um, combined with typically an annual simulation period that necessitates the use of the CHPC. For each monthly simulation, we can use between 48 and 72 cores. Um, we do run months in parallel and the normal queue allows about three months at a time. Each month generally takes one to two days. And we can run um, as little as just one run if it's just a one year to understand, you know, 2019, for example, for a management plan. But also then if we want to get into multi-year or multi-scenario, we have a lot more runs. And then we use WARF as the input for our meteorological parameters. And for that, we use the CHPC installation. This is a schematic of our air quality modeling platform. And um, we have quite a few different inputs. CAMEX is our model that puts out ambient, that simulates ambient concentrations that we use in a lot of different studies to look at different impacts. 
we've the fatalysis rates and the initial boundary conditions come from global products and global models. The meteorological input, if we use historical, we use WARF on the CHPC. If we look at climate change, so what will air quality be in 20 years, we can use the climate change model that, the, that our group runs, CCAM, that's run on the CHPC as well as inputs. And also we spend a lot of time developing our local emission inventory. So this is to try to um, characterize all of the sources of pollutants um, in the model. And of course, um, that is a really key input. If you don't get the inputs correct of what is being emitted, it's very hard then to get the resultant ambient concentrations correct. So we spend a lot of time on our emission sources. Just some of the examples are shown here to the right. Um, the sectors, we try to be as comprehensive in the sectors and in the species that we cover. For the global emission inventories, we cut, use for three different sources. And this is mostly because we don't have better local data for it. If we had better local data um, or we could do a better job, we would improve on these. The ones in blue are what we develop um, ourselves and actually windblown dust and biogenic volatile organic compounds is a, our emission models that are run also on the CHPC. For all the other ones, we just do the pre-processing of the emissions before it goes into the model on the CHPC. <laughs> and, you know, we're not, of course, the only group that's running a, an air quality model. There are global and regional modeling available from many other modeling centers. For example, NASA and in EU, the ECWMF, they run global air quality models. There are forecasts that are available. You can go online and see what the air quality forecast is tomorrow. However, these also have very large uncertainties because they're not very well, the information and the inputs going on for South Africa are not well parameterized. And because our air quality modeling and what we can do on the CHPC, it does put us on par with these large international modeling groups while we just focus on South Africa. So we're working on developing collaborations and um, really using these collaborations to improve the representation of South Africa in our global model so that they can also get it better. And this is one example where this um, has started to happen. So this is a model from, this is NASA's model output, the GS model. It's particulate matter, the annual average for 2019. And the reason we needed this was actually for COVID work when the CSIR was working on understanding where vulnerable populations were, you know, exposure to air pollution would make, could make one more vulnerable to COVID. And so we wanted to give an idea to the Department of Health, where could, these, where could this be? However, we didn't have a national run completed yet. So we asked NASA to, to provide us with some information. And this is what they provided us. We do see the coarse resolution of a global model makes it so that how tanks kind of a blob it doesn't really show where the vulnerable areas are, other than urban areas are. Also, if we look at this 125 micrograms per meter cubed, that's really, really high. So what we did is we said, okay, we don't have a local global run, um, um, national run yet, but we do have this domain that's in a little bit lighter blue in this square. And so we also sent this on to the National Department of Health because you can see it's much higher spatial resolution. So you can start to pick out where are the particulate levels very high and the PM causes um, quite a lot of the health burden due to air quality. So it's a very important pollutant to understand. And we can also see, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the top, the, 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 the peak is 29 and hours rather than 125. And so that also helped that there was overestimation in the NASA model. And we have heard back from NASA since there that they did find some issues and that they have been able to improve their modeling to get closer to what we've seen. So just in the last few slides, I wanted to show, you know, some timely things that we've been doing with our model runs. Um, and this is the impacts of the COVID lockdown measures on air quality. I just put this no photos here because this is still preliminary work. We haven't published it. We're in the middle of writing it up. Um, but I just wanted to show a few slides of some of the work we've done that wouldn't have been possible without the CHPC. And so I don't think I have to go over the timeline very much. I just want to note that I'll show today just some results from level five. So our strict, strict lockdown way back in April. And also if you remember the schools closed in the 18th of March, and then we had lockdown announced on the 23rd of March. And if we look at activity data during this time, you know, some people were rushing to the grocery stores, lots of different things happened. So when I look pre-lockdown, when we talk about that, we'll look before March, March 18. And this is a project we're doing together with researchers from University College London and the Northwest University. 
And in this, we have been using the three different sources that I noted before, surface, monitoring, our model, and satellites as well. We're using both the CHPC to analyze both the satellite and the model and to run the model as well. We don't need it for the surface network because the data needs aren't that great. And so first looking at the space-based perspective in 2020, um, this is, sorry, the map is on here, I forgot to put that. This is kind of how Tang and Mpumalanga, and then you can see the Waterberg plants up here. So this is using trope only. This is looking at the tropospheric column of NO2. Remember NO2 is a pollutant itself and it's also a precursor for ozone. Um, normally what we would expect is as we go into our winter, we would expect column and ground-based measurements of NO2 to, to get higher. But what we saw in 2020, different from all the other years, was a decrease in April. This here is now for the domain. We saw as 20% less than March. All of these circles are the ESCOM power stations. And then in May, we started to see a pickup again. And that was very similar to what we saw at the ground bell stations. I won't get into all of it today. I won't show those. Um, but we saw a decrease in NO2 also in level five in April, when if we look at previous years, we would have expected an increase. But of course, this is the atmosphere. I've already threw up lots of chemical equations. You know, I've threw up schematics. A lot is happening. And so the first thing that we're doing to try to really unravel this is to use our model um, in order to change different aspects to see what happens. And the first thing that we've run that I'll show here is business as usual. And in the business as usual, we used meteorology for 2020, but we used an older emissions inventory. So one that didn't have lockdown because we know particularly during level five, there were decreases in industry and ESCOM, a lot fewer people on the road. So we wanted to see what would have happened if lockdown didn't happen. What would we have expected the air quality to be? <clears throat> and so we ran CAMEX for this. We used the CHPC to run WARF and also CAMEX. What I show here is just the monthly cycle just to show some highlights. So these are different monitoring stations. The red are in Pretoria, the blue are in the Ball Triangle, it's just south of Johannesburg, and then different in Pumalanga sites in blue. The dotted line is the model, the solid line are the observations. In order to get these monthly, um, these monthly data points, I use the 70% data threshold, um, data completeness threshold, which is why some of them have, um, don't have data because they didn't have that much data. But what we can see as we look across sites is while the monitoring did see this decrease as I noted and that also saw in satellites, we don't really see it in the model. The model, the business as usual, would not have expected such large decreases. Of the sites we looked at under business as usual, we would have expected only two of these sites to show small decreases. However, in the monitoring data, we did see that we had um, all of the sites showed a decrease. And the historical data also showed that that is not what is normal for April. So we do believe this is a really anomalous April and that the COVID lockdown did have an impact on the NO2. We're also using the CHPC to look between the satellite and the simulated column of tropospheric um, NO2. And so what's on the right is what we've simulated for tropospheric NO2 and for February and the trope OMI, which is the satellite view that passes over us around one o'clock in our afternoon. We can see that the spatially, we um, do simulate the values quite well. However, CAMEX does have an overestimate and we're still working on what that is. And we're, um, because of course CAMEX, as it simulates all of the levels is sensitive to ground-based um, concentrations. Trope OMI, as it's looking from space is not. Um, and so there is quite a lot of more work that we need to do to look at these columns and then also how they diverge as we do CAMEX as um, from the business as usual scenario and trope only measuring what, what, what happened. We also plan to do perturbation experiments in CAMEX to, under, to see if we can start to match or see what's driving these different changes in, um, in pollution levels and the spatial relative changes as well. So my last two slides in just summary is that you know, we focus on air quality and a lot of the work in South Africa, but we are looking to work more in Africa just because we have large uncertainties and it's estimated to have large impacts even though there are high uncertainties. And in order to be able to improve air quality and have effective management interventions, we need to be able to understand its impacts and simulate different scenarios. There's limited resources and we need to improve air quality, so we need to get it right. Um, and our air quality work, as I've shown, we are working with others um, internationally to try to improve the representation of South Africa in global models. And just really the final note is that the CHPC simply, it makes our work possible. 
we can run these more advanced models that take into account chemistry that are the same models that other that are run elsewhere, but now with local inputs and so we can do a better job of representing South Africa and Southern Africa air quality at fine resolution and also that now we have control to run multiple scenarios to investigate what would happen if we did different air quality management. So just to finalize the acknowledgements, the data were from SACWIS, and if you're ever interested in air quality data, this is where you can get it. Um, the satellite observations were from Trump Omi. Of course, we ran the models on the CHPC, and the emissions inventory for the COVID work that I showed was developed in a DEF-funded project. And then the COVID work for this was funded by a parliamentary grant, and we were part of the, the reference group, the CERG reference group as well. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you for that particularly interesting talk, Rebecca. Um, we have the inevitable question from Kun Reynolds, if I may read that. Uh, the question is, thank you, Rebecca, very interesting presentation. I'm wondering how much of the computational load in models like CAMX is taken up with a highly complex uh, reaction chemistry in CB6? Has there been much work done on reducing or optimizing the mechanisms for local applications to improve performance? So yeah, so we haven't done that and I'll let um, Magesh also come in. He's our lead air quality modeler. So we're a small group. We haven't done that type of work. There is some work within the atmospheric community to see because the chemistry is really computationally expensive if you take out the meteorology, trying to see what machine learning techniques can be used for that. Um, there is a lot of course non-linearity um, within it, so it's a complex as well. Magesh, do you wanna add anything to that while I look at the next um, question? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, that, that is true. That is actually true. That is part of the, the most expensive part of the model. And actually, Rebecca and I were talking about it earlier today. There have been uh, successive improvements, uh, even within carbon bond six. Uh, I know there's been reductions recently to remove some of the, the halogens. But as we go forward, we, we in our group, we tend to rely on the larger groups that have access to, you know, these chemistry um, um, solvers, the people who actually wrote them, but then also the people that have the smog chamber studies. So a lot of it is done by the US EPA. Uh, there are smaller groups maybe in Europe as well, but uh, out of those groups tend to come out most of the improvements in, 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 in what we see. They, they, there actually hasn't been much improvement in the chemical solvers themselves. Uh, but, but as we go forward, as Rebecca mentioned, there are some interesting work coming out in using machine learning to, help, to hopefully improve on at least the, the more well-known reactions. Thanks for that, Mugesh. I'll just read the next question from uh, Kasim Tondi. Many thanks for the really inspiring talk. On one of the earlier slides, you showed the global pattern of pollution on which the African continent looked least, uh, least polluted apparently due to lack of data. Most visualization dashboards rely on data collected by individual countries. Obviously this is an issue as many countries are quite constrained on data capturing capacities. What strikes me is that at one point you requested data from NASA, which appears to be in high resolution showing very specific locations in South Africa. Uh, that means we have to act, that means we have access to data. Why isn't this shared widely? Maybe you could just yeah. uh, explain this a bit more clearly. Yeah, Thanks. I can. So yes, you're right. There are very few measurements in um, across Africa. And a lot of that that is on the OpenAQ are low cost sensors. That's not true for South Africa. We have a regulatory, so quite regulatory grade, high um, performance instruments, but many places have these low cost sensors, which are not as robust and not as stable either. Um, and so when you can see air quality forecast, and yes, you're right, you can find apps that tell you the air quality of places, you always have to question where the data comes from because that data doesn't exist a lot of places. And so it comes from combining many times models and satellites. So the NASA that I saw showed is, a, is from their air quality forecast and that is available online. But as we showed, they were off about five times on our particulate matter. Um, they overestimated by a lot. They just, and, the, and we are trying to work together um, to try to get our emission inventories, our, us being like the South African air quality community, you know, to try to improve the representation in these global models. Because from the lack of monitoring, it looks like air quality in Africa isn't a problem. And every time a monitoring station goes up, it is a problem. 
And then you have models that aren't giving, you know, what we find on the ground to be the same answer. So we have a lot of conflicting information, which of course decision makers very, very easily can say, well, we don't know the answer, so we're not going to do anything about it. Um, so the ECWMF and NASA model uh, are available if you're interested, but please do just take it all with a grain of salt and um, that those are models when the inputs, we're working on helping to them to work on the inputs. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for those explanations, Rebecca. Uh, it looks like we're out of questions now and we're ready to talk, move on to our next uh, presentation. Thank it you. is my pleasure to uh, introduce Ndumisum Tembo. Uh, he's an engineer working at uh, Epsilon um, Aerospace uh, doing computational mechanics. Uh, we got him on board as a commercial user um, about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago. And it, it was really a privilege actually um, getting this done because we've our experience with getting uh, commercial users onto the CHPC has been very different from the academic world. Um, we find academic worlds, uh, the, the, the academic researchers are always very ready to absorb any amount of computational power that we can put at their disposal. But getting a lot of computing into private industry has turned out to be surprisingly difficult. Uh, but Nubisa just climbed in, um, boots and all and started running up computational hours at a rate that I've seldom seen. And it was very gratifying to see that happen. So um, please proceed, Miso. Thank you for the introduction, Charles. Um, I have a pre-recorded presentation that I will play out. So I'm happy to take any questions during the course of the presentation. Okay. Uh, if you, if you proceed with that then. We're not hearing any sound from the presentation. And we so are we not hearing your presentation? Sorry, Charles. Are you hearing the presentation? No, we can see we can see it playing, but we're not getting the sound. Any sounds? Okay. Um, is it any different? I heard something faintly in the background, but we're certainly not getting the sound of the presentation. I'm not sure why that is the case. Okay, let's try it again. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dumisum Tembu. I am an aeronautical engineer at Epsilon Engineering Services. Today I'll be sharing a talk entitled Epsilon Aerospace Computational Mechanics. This is in fact the name of our computational mechanics research program. So I'll be sharing broadly on the kind of computational mechanics work that we do here at Epsilon, and specifically on how we benefit from high performance computing. To begin with, a bit of an overview on what the talk will entail. I'll start by giving general information about Epsilon Engineering Services. I will then talk about the aerospace computational mechanics research program that we have here at Epsilon. I also touch on weapon systems integration and how it benefits from computational mechanics. I'll also look into the relevance of high performance computing in weapon systems integration. And finally, I will touch on the key research outcomes that we gather from the aerospace computational mechanics research program. 
Epsilon Engineering is a private company that is based in Centurion in the Gauteng province of South Africa. The company was founded in 1988 when directors Ms. Johan Badenhorst and the late Mr. David Taylor broke away from various key companies in the South African aeronautics and armament industries. The company forms part of the South African aerospace and defense industry and has core activities in aeronautical engineering, composite technology, electrical and electronic engineering, mechanical engineering and system engineering. Epsilon provides a wide range of expertise, which includes systems engineering, weapons integration, arming development and testing, aeronautics, which includes aerodynamics, structural analysis, and pipe mechanics. Epsilon is also involved in machine design, design and manufacture, composite design manufacturing and testing, and most recently naval architecture, and accommodates general engineering challenges. Under weapon systems and weapon systems integration, Epsilon has been involved in development, manufacture, and testing of an electronic port for the CSIR. And Epsilon has been involved in various development and qualification um, projects for aircraft stores. Um, this picture shows the flight testing under such a development program and aesthetic structural testing also under such a development program. Epsilon has developed a wide range of UAVs which differ in weight class and in mission. Epsilon has most recently developed a small catapult and hand launch UAV platform with 1.8 meter wingspan and 3 kg maximum takeoff weight for aerial surveillance. Epsilon has also most recently um, developed a medium sized conventional takeoff and landing UAV platform with six meter wingspan, maximum takeoff weight of 80 kilograms for situational awareness and reconnaissance. Epsilon has in the past developed a large conventional takeoff and landing UAV platform with 7.5 meter wingspan and 250 kilograms maximum takeoff weight for aerial um, surveillance or mapping. Um, this figure shows a willful tree arrangement for structural testing of a cantilever wing, which is also conducted at Epsilon. Um, Epsilon has also been involved in the development and manufacture of a gyro of gyrocopter blades. Um, so this is a dynamic test rig for such a development. Um, Rotary wing geolo geologic surveillance um, rigs have also been developed at Epsilon. Um, this is a picture that shows that. And most recently, Epsilon has also been involved in the uh, development and manufacturing of a high speed sea patrol vessel with attack and defense capability. The Epsilon Aerospace Computational Mechanics Research Program finds relevance in the aerospace and defense industry um, with areas of development in weapon systems integration, unmanned aerial vehicle, and naval architecture. State-of-the-art computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis are design analysis tools that are used routinely as a necessary part of the engineering design process. And they find the application in the conceptual and or engineering design phase. Stasis M plus and open form are software currently used for safety. Um, and ANSYS mechanical software is currently used for finite element analysis. Product development can be roughly divided into two phases. Um, the first being design is capitulated and manufacturing. Design analysis finds relevance in the design phase of product development and precedes design optimization and design selection. Design analysis is important because it certifies confidence level in optimized and selected design, which is of course confirmed by physical testing of finished product. 
Now, the quality of the results obtained in design analysis is directly related to the quality of the conducted analysis and the analysis tools that are used. I'll briefly outline some work which has been done under the Aerospace Computational Mechanics Research Program. In Weapon Systems Integration, we've been involved in a project that required the evaluation of an existing pylon for external store carriage on a main turboprop fixed wing aircraft. And for the same aircraft and store configuration, the development of a pylon. High speed subsonic flight was modeled in CFD, um, and there was to determine the external store aerodynamic limit loads in isolated flight and in carriage. This was done for various maneuver cases. They've also been involved in a project that required the development and manufacture of a composite enclosure for external storage of electronic equipment for a manned jet aircraft. So a high speed but transonic flight now was modeled in CFD and that was to determine the aerodynamic limit loads that the enclosure would experience during flight. The pressure, wash stress, shear stress and temperature profiles were also of importance and the Mach number flow characteristics also. We've also been involved in the evaluation of an air cooling system for a UAV engine, which experienced overheating during um, climbing flight and uh, overcooling during uh, descending flight. Low speed flight was modeled in CFD. Um, that was to determine the flow trajectory through cowling and onto engine um, cylinder head and cooling fins. And it was realized that the cowling design optimization was necessary to manipulate the flow trajectory and improve efficiency of a cooling system. They've also been um, involved in fuse large optimization um, problems where we had to optimize the fuse large for a medium sized hybrid VTOL UAV to increase its payload capacity. Um, and also to reduce excess payload capacity and improve hand launch capability for a small catapult and hand launch UAV platform. In both cases, low speed transitional flow was modeled in CFD. Um, there was to ascertain the drag force and boundary layer behavior for the aerodynamic configuration. We've also been involved in a project that required a cantilever wing structural testing for a medium sized and long endurance hybrid V12 UAV with high payload capacity. Um, low speed transitional flow is modeled in safety. Um, that was to determine the span wise lift distribution for use in Wiffle Tree design for structural testing. Um, this was, in fact, um, done to validate. Um, some of the tools that are used for the same uh, purpose, such as the shrink approximation and the AVR. We have also been involved in the verification of safety turbulence or transition modeling. Um, this has been done by the use of special grid convergence index based on the Richardson extrapolation and basically gives a measure of the numerical error which is incurred um, in simulation. This was done uh, specifically for a high-speed transonic flight um, of a pylon fairing in isolation for a manned turboprop fixed wing aircraft. Um, and we focused specifically on the drag coefficient values. We also do validation of safety turbulence and transitional models against reputational experimental and numerical data. Uh, this is an example of one such validation where the NACO 0012 was considered um, a lift coefficient, drag coefficient, and um, core pressure distribution uh, where engineering quantities of interest for 
a low Reynolds number um, range. Um, we have also been involved in the project that required the development and manufacture of a high-speed sea patrol vessel with a tech and defense capability, uh, the sea vessel being a catamaran configuration with a stepped hull um, and hydrofoil. Safety model was um, set up um, to optimize design by limiting hydrofoil and plate ventilation um, by introducing a leading edge profile and also limiting propeller ventilation by clearing propeller out of entrained airflow path. A development area that has made extensive use of high performance computing is weapon systems integration. Weapon systems integration involves the integration of weapon systems onto an aircraft configuration. Perhaps around this has been the development of an external store shell, uh, for example, a composite enclosure for external storage of electronic systems as depicted. This, it has also been the development of an aircraft store interface for external store suspension on aircraft configuration, um, which is a pylon, as also um, depicted. External store carriage can be integrated, integrated on an aircraft fuse launch, it can be on an aircraft wing, it can be on both. And as mentioned, an aircraft store interface, which is a pylon, is designed to mount external stores on an aircraft. Now, according to design standard, in the case of a pylon design, the pylon must be able to safely react all store carriage loads within the store carriage envelope of aircraft. And additionally, if the store is a weapon, the pilot must react the dynamic loads when the launcher has been engaged. An external store carriage flight envelope, um, also known as VH diagram, is depicted. Um, this is a generic VH diagram and certain points within the flight envelope are identified as seen. Now, the external store carriage flight envelope imposes a restriction on the aircraft operation based on a safe speed and altitude range. And basically demonstrates the capability of the aircraft in terms of its minimum speed and maximum speed within an allowable altitude range from sea level to aircraft service ceiling um, for the store carriage configuration. Design standard mandates that the limit loads acting on the store, external store are calculated for flight for free stream conditions specified on the VH diagram and based on uh, prescribed maneuvers the prescribed maneuvers are in terms of store angle of attack and side slip angle. The given tables show how maneuver cases are constructed for specific flight envelope points for fuse large mounted stores and wing mounted stores. And as can be seen for the symmetric pull up maneuver and array of store ends of attack is prescribed um, for a positive and a negative sign slip angle. A rigging angle of zero and negative three must also be included in analysis. So this amounts to a minimum of eight load analysis points for each maneuver case. Um, and one can quickly appreciate that an extensive uh, load analysis is required to determine um, a comprehensive load uh, matrix. Now, the primary interest in the extensive load analysis is to identify store carriage critical loads and maneuvers in the entire flight envelope. The pylon is then designed to react those critical loads. 
Now the store carriage critical load matrix is used as input to the finite element analysis. The pylon design is then optimized to react to the store carriage critical loads um, and consequently all the store carriage loads within the carriage envelope. Now, to determine the extensive aerodynamic load um, for specific flight maneuvers at irrelevant points in the flight envelope, high fidelity CFD models are required. And as mentioned, the acquired critical load matrix is input to the finite element structural analysis. Then the use of high performance computing allows for those high fidelity safety models to be generated and simulated. Um, and it makes finite bone safety and finite element analysis a feasible and practical, feasible and practical tools in development. Reynolds Average Navier Stokes turbulence modeling approach was implemented in open form um, in the case of weapon systems integration. Um, and the high solver was used to solve the high speed and compressible aerodynamic flow. Run safety is a full turbulence modeling approach to solve turbulent flow problems. Um, turbulence models encapsulate the physics of turbulent flow in them phenomena and are used to model turbulent flow. The turbulence models are solved with the RANS equations and they complete the system of equation. Um, the SST K omega turbulence um, two equation A viscosity model was used to model the high speed compressible and turbulent aerodynamic flow. Now the RANS turbulence model equations were solved in a finite volume mesh. Pertinent areas of the aerodynamic flow relate to the aircraft store configuration boundary layer, um, aircraft store proximity, aircraft store configuration wake, and far field boundaries of computational domain. Um, so an appropriate turbulent boundary layer model um, is necessary with um, adequate mesh resolution. An appropriate mesh resolution at aircraft store proximity and aircraft store configuration wake is also important. Um, and appropriate free stream conditions at far field boundaries are also very critical. The HISO solver is a robust high speed aerodynamic solver that was developed at the aeronautic systems competency area of the CSIR, um, working with the Flamengo group of ARMSCO. Is a coupled density based solver um, that solves Ryan's turbulence model equations for a compressible flow. Now, the Ryan's turbulence model um, was typically solved on a 20 million element mesh. Now, the HISO code was scaled on the CHPC cluster, and as can be seen, it scales very well up until roughly 960 CPU cores, where it then begins to dip, but also increases again at 1,250 CPU cores, up until 1,350 CPU cores, after which it then flattens. Now, the typical HPC hardware usage for us was about 20 compute nodes, which is equivalent to 480 CPU cores in MPI, with an average roll time of 18 hours to complete 11 analysis points. Now, the key research outcomes in weapon systems integration was firstly development cost reduction um, by mitigating the need for wind tunnel experiments um, to develop the necessary comprehensive aerodynamic load data set. Um, and the aerodynamic load data set was developed in a relatively short period of time. Um, the load data set allows for an in-depth understanding of the aircraft store interaction. Um, the identification of store carriage critical loads and maneuver um, maneuvers for 
flight envelope was also a, uh, a key outcome. Um, and design optimization was made possible um, so that the store can react the carriage critical loads. Um, and we were able to have confidence in that design, um, which of course was later confirmed by physical testing um, and flight testing of finished product. Um, and development of optimal product that satisfies um, client specification was another um, key research outcome. Now, in UAV design, um, reliable quantitative and qualitative data was um, gathered. Um, and the quantitative data allows for UAV performance characterization as well as static stability characterization. Um, and another key research outcome was problem solving and design optimization. Um, so the gathered data, quantitative and qualitative data allows for in-depth understanding of design challenges and informs design optimization. Um, key research outcomes in naval architecture, um, again, is in problem solving and in design optimization, where qualitative data in this case um, allowed for a, a good understanding of the design challenges um, that uh, the designer is experiencing and also informed design optimization. Um, um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ndumiso. Um, is anybody, oh, there's the inevitable Quinn question, so let me read that to you. Thank you, Ndumiso, great presentation. Just a comment, whenever we talk to private industry about using off-site compute like CHPC, the question of data privacy and security often comes up. I can imagine that in your business, those requirements must be extreme. The fact that Epsilon managed to overcome those concerns could be a very good case to encourage other industry users. Uh, would you like to answer that, Nabisa? Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Sure, Charles. Um, yeah, those are obviously concerns um, that my management had um, initially when starting to use the CHPC. Um, but having spoken with the management, we were quickly assured that we would have that confidentiality. Um, and so that that was really helpful on our side. And then so we've been able to set up models, um, run our models, gather our data, and uh, not really have to worry about our data leaking and, and being used elsewhere. Um, and also probably to just uh, extend that answer, we derive a lot from that data itself, but there's other processes um, that we have to go through with the data itself. So, so that data may be meaningful or may not be meaningful depending on who gets access to the data, but we ultimately have to combine that aerodynamic data with inertial data, um, which we have on our side, and then ultimately get the, the critical loads, which I was talking about. So. Um, so it's just not a, a, a big, big issue for us, um, given that confidentiality is, um, is, is guaranteed or is promised um, from the CHPC side. And also that if one doesn't really, really know um, the full information about what we are trying to achieve, they will probably not make um, any use of the data, any sensible use of the data. Yeah, th thanks for that, Nimisa. I have to share my own experience of that as well. As even if somebody was able to steal the data set, um, all they're really going to achieve is to take up an awful lot of time consuming, uh, confusing themselves. You need context to make sense of this kind of data. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I've got one I want to ask. Um, the holy grail of store aerodynamics. Uh, you're looking at, uh, at some point, doing a fully dynamic uh, store separation simulation with an overset mesh? Um, we, we do have a, um, a UARV, which is a, a panel code that has been developed in-house. So, so that is how we basically do those kind of simulations. Um, 
but but interesting question perhaps something we can look into in the future um but at the moment it, it has been used quite routinely for several years now um to basically simulate store release um and has has given quite reliable data uh, previously and has been used in the development process um but but interesting question we'll probably uh, maybe look into that in the future We'll talk about that again. Thank you very much, Ndimiso. If there are no further questions, uh, just all that remains is to thank both speakers and the audience as well. Thank you for your attendance and, and attention. Um, and hereby we declare the session closed. Okay, thank you, Charles. <laughs>